thanks for coming out this morning, and thanks for that introduction, Georg. And I uh, will say that my um, this is not an addition. I am not, you know, what, what I will be describing is my longstanding, not necessarily very innovative, or innovative as we say, um, addition. So it's textual and it's distinctive, and I stand by it. Um, and I'm, I'm actually considering this essay a kind of speculation that I hope you'll help me with. Um, it, I stress that I, I'm not studying women writers or an individual writer. Um, although it's literary, I am looking at biographies by men and women about women of all kinds. And we, in, it, you know, very interesting. I love what you're doing with Gaynell. Um, I, we study social networks formed by books. Not you know so documentary social networks, uh, collections of biographies where people not necessarily at all related to each other are represented in the same book. Another name for that is prosopography. So bear with some reflections and examples. And as I was thinking, I'm going to Austria, or I'd like to go to Austria. Let me think about Austria in my database. Um, I'm from the University of Virginia. I answer to yes, I'm from Virginia. I'm not from Virginia reflect upon this as I'm talking about uh, what I'm talking about today. And I did change my title. So this, you see there, is, is the title I'm standing by today. So I'd like us to consider the problem of using GIS and mapping tools when it comes to the history of women. I have used them. I love them. I teach my students how to work with story maps. I work with many in uh, the two DH centers, of which I'm the faculty uh, director at the University of Virginia, and beyond these centers, to reveal environmental in injustice or trace prosopographies of African Americans, for example. Mapping may obscure, though, the complexity of biographical narratives and really may tell us a bunch of lies. Now, this is not advanced. Yes, it is. So, just to uh, quickly, and I will be aware of time. So this is my digital project. Um, I can talk more later about that. Um, I leave that, but most of the slides I will let you read while I proceed. So, history may be written by the victors, but it is certainly written by survivors and successors. There are no neutral, unaffiliated histories or biographies or memoirs any more than data are merely neutral givens. Remember jo Johanna Drucker talking about CAPTA. For centuries, women and others have objected to the predominance of European men in histories and biographies. The statue of Maria Theresia and the, mu and the museum dedicated to Sisi, Empress Elizabeth in Vienna, are mere indications of age-old kinds of exceptions of female rulers and celebrities. But to a surprising degree, the research in my project, which is based on my University of Chicago Press book, How to Make It as a Woman, which was a sort of a joke, um, How to Make It as a Woman uh, was my book. Uh, it, it, my research has shown that male as well as female authors and publishers extended the range of biographies of women way, well beyond Maria Theresa and Cece. Um, for now, I defer discussion of the ethics of categorizing people, Susan Brown, Laura Mandel, and others, including me and feminist DH, have addressed the binary MF, and we have to work with it to some extent. The books listed in my project, this is not an addition or a repository of text, they claim their subjects are women. And then what gets interesting is how gender and identity break down with the, the incredible diversity of the subjects. This would be the public interface now. A long -standing, it's a long-standing project supported by the Institute for Advanced Technology and the Humanities, IF, and Scholars Lab at UVA. It strives to theorize biographical narratives and gender, race, and class. Biographies, by definition, are nominally about one person or named sets, and much like histories or travel writing, they declare or presuppose affiliations, patriotic, religious, cultural, and socioeconomic. 
The nonfiction narratives about historical events and women or men who participated in them may, may aspire to more or less fidelity to facts, but they share the bias of, social of the social context of writing. My project in Literary Feminist DH is at, sorry, I'm covering my own text. My project in Literary Feminist DH is at the core a bibliography interdependent with WorldCat, with Hathi Trust. Uh, so many of the texts are available, but some are still in copyright, as well as I've collaborated with social networks and archival context, which works with archival descriptions. So it's also a kind of prosopography. There are 1,272 English language books narrating at least three women's lives and women only. Um, went to a lot of bibliographical trouble. And they're written by men as well as women. This genre, female prosopography, has appeared over millennia. Um, it's not a new idea, but proliferated with the rise of printing and the modern nation state. CBW, as we call it, proud, we proudly differ from the overwhelming use of corporate novels. See my recent article with Catherine Bode and, and others in the NLH special issue, But Why Always the Novel? CBW's mid-range reading methods, which I'm happy to talk about at another time, were developed, I want to just note, with Daniel Pitty, Worthy Martin, Rennie Mapp, who is here at this conference, and others. It's a stand we use a stand-aside XML schema, not innovative, except in its, well, I'll, I can go further on to it. So it's called Biographical and Elements and Structure Schema BESS. And we use control values for various element types, events, discourse, topos, and so on. So it's not an addition, it's an annotation. TEI structured texts, two researchers go through each text. It's coded, we call it mid-range in part because we're numbering paragraphs, so I do not really care where the comma was in the original book. And it doesn't have OCR problems because these are printed books, or it has minimal OCR problems. The database collates tens of thousands of chapters about more than 8,000 women, and to our surprise, two-thirds of them only appear once. So we might be the one narrative about quite a lot of uh, women. Sometimes they were queens. Just... Each volume and person has a range in our database of possible types. So a book may be a world history sample or German, but not one, uh, there not, there's not one collection that signals Austria in its title. I was looking, of course, there are five that flag Australia. So I really want to emphasize um, in the importance of space in biography and its instability. So a few more of the, the coming slides are such sort of thought pieces. The shortest biography gives birthplace and nationality. I promise you the most common uh, natural language utterance at this conference is where are you from? Si cities claim famous people with monuments and plaques, and it, they do so even regardless of birth. Biographies of women as well as men are tied to national and similar affiliations. This may seem obvious, but it's really extraordinary once you really focus on biography, how much, how nationalist it is. To be part of written history, it seems worth saying, one needs to have been written about, and of course this is still true in Wikipedia and in, in its insistence on notability, and most men, and all but a fraction of women, were not. So it's, a, it's watching a kind of massacre in slow time. Even autobiography or biography written by proud family members, even when you go to the archives and look at actual correspondence, dates and facts will be wrong not necessarily intentionally. Such has been the challenge for any attempt at the likenesses of people in the past before the internet. Um, I just want to say chat GPT cannot do this for us. Um, I think of it as the most that has been thought and said, and I'm saying that even the Library of Congress gets people's birthdays wrong. Um, so you, we have noise, and then we will compound it if we're not careful. Um, so we care about the space in biography, but we also don't necessarily treat it properly, or and certainly dates are, are fungible. So, but I do pursue literary geography and narrat narratology's spatial turn in my work with CBW and my book on literary tourism. I wrote a book about Holmes and Haunts books. What 
I and others have called topobiography, can reveal different capacities to move and different power relations in place for women and of all people of many eras, cultures, races, or ethnic identities. In our XML schema, any type of event that specifies its setting in Vienna, for example, we only would, call, would tag it location setting city, understanding that a text search could get you back to Vienna. We're trying to abstract it and then find paragraphs in which the action of these personae take place in cities. Again, the usual questions about facts, which are surprisingly debatable for well-known biographical subjects of any social identity, are of less interest to this group working with me than the gendered portrayal of female agency in the context of the book's presenters. The authors and publishers have identified a gender theme by choosing only women, and the readers will be having their contemporary responses to those gender ideologies. So I'd love in the conversation after the talk to talk about approaches to toponyms, uh, but with best, best analysis of multiple versions of the same person's life or lives of the same by the same author in the same book, you know, people who've been grouped together in a social, documentary social network. We have worked with GIS data. We've developed time, standard time and date, we call them time points, in Excel spreadsheets, and it's very mappable. We've done it. I'm not showing that so much today. We've also used Python scripts that analyze the co-locations of best values. Uh, we have about 400 of these best analyses done on a sample of, of the corpus, not the entire 1,200 books. Very labor intensive, and it's a combination of approaches, which is appropriate when we have already built the bibliography. We know a lot about these books. We're not working with Google Ngram. And we're open to discussing other methods in the future. So, moving ahead. Um, I just want to comment that it's, it's only moderately useful to think about geolocating persons, um, and this came up today in this conference, Diane Jakaki mentioning that, it, you know, the notation, the data about institutional affiliation and conference programs is not a proxy. You know, you don't all come from the institutions you're working at, as I'm learning very explicitly, and I thought Nabil's CDP was doing interesting work using it as a proxy. We do what we also should problematize. In the digital project, so again, I want to, I'll, I'll come back to this point from Virginia Woolf. In the digital project CBW, we recognize the nationalism that pervades biographies, even in these Anglophone, this is all world Anglophone, British and North American collections that trade in the names of women. Our ontologies, philosophical in the philosophical and digital senses, are based on spatial and based on spatial and temporal conventions, face limitations in conveying the mobility in space-time of an indig individual and the social networks or conceptual categories of their types: English, Austrian, Queen, writer. DH mapping can place undue confidence in GIS data and current borders regarding marginal subjects and pre-modern times. A medievalist student of mine just realized she had to give up because the pilgrims were not using our notion of latitude and longitude or anything resembling a modern map. So just as an illustration of the very problematic that you're all familiar with, you have to use the historic map layer any time, and this would be just for you to look at for just a moment. So to some more, some more particular examples, this is an, a, by a person who is a subject in, in uh, CBW, Francis Trollope. Um, novelist mother of Antony Trollope. She lived for many years in a circuit of Italy and the Austrian Empire, annually migrating between them. But she is known, and all of the biographies in CBW omit her residence in Italy, continue to call her an English woman, which of course she was by birth. Domestic Manners of the Americans was her breakthrough book, and it's as if she never wrote anything else. The Americans are pissed off and keep writing about Francis Trollope. 
as having spent three years, and she did, in the United States. Perhaps it would have become a, a permanent residency, but no one ever calls her an American. I'm just very interested in a perfect example. But here, I like that she wrote travel logs about Vienna and Paris, very much immersive and very much in getting to know people. And they were ethnographic in lots of ways, and she had the proper languages. Um, so just a, 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 a thought. And I've omitted... We have mapped her travels. We have done other various work to sort of look at all the versions of Frances Trollope. But for time today, we're moving on to thinking about Austria. And really, I just chose the opportunity when I saw the conference call. Um, as Wilson insists, the identity of woman is at odds. Now I need to move my cursor so that I can scroll my text. Um, the identity of woman is at odds with patrimony, patriarchy, and patri patriotism, and, of course, war, kinship, and property practices, practices have been structured between men. Since the 19th century anthropology that influenced both Marx and Freud, the exchange of women has been understood as a cross-cultural structure. Suffice it to say, brevity, that the CBW project was more textual than spatial. Usually, in it, and we initially focused primarily on publication places, but as we work, think further, ooh, I just lost my, sorry, as we think further about um, the topobiography topo um, in our data, database, we've started to identify more national types. So we're really working towards the extra textual spatial data besides publication partly realizing, as you undoubtedly have, that women often are the causes of wars, un not unlike um, Helen of Troy. And here we have um, the example of Nitus, on, you see down uh, at 54, Thomas Haywood's The General History of Women Containing the Lives of the Most Holy and Profane of 1657. He's simply redacting Herodotus and telling a kind of semi-legendary story of a beautiful daughter who is substituted in disguise as an Egyptian diplomatic bride to cheat an enemy. Um, these, these stories that circulate in the 17th century then become kind of adapted in new secular ways in later books. In CBW's database, which is centered in 1830-1940, only 32 women, mostly royal, are typed Austrian, but almost immediately all of them, their, uh, their nationality breaks down. Um, and so these are the alternative names from Ray Teresa, and, uh, you know, just, just have a look at that. As in the early modern handwritten newsletters discussed by Gabor Toth in his talk yesterday, um, the, the noteworthy women tend to be identified by high rank, it should be no surprise that these women would accrue these various titles because of our understanding of ethnologic and religious dynastic rule. So my final examples today, um, which I go through uh, rather quickly, are of books in the 20th century, early 20th century. Uh, Wilmot Buxton's A Book of Noble Women in 1907 Noble, clearly, if you look at the titles, the names of the people in it, does not mean the rank. It means having achieved something remarkable. And questionable people get in with really quite remarkable people. I think most of you are fans of Jane Austen. Um, all versions of the Dauphine, who became the queen as wife of Louis XVI, dwell on the French people's allergic reaction to the Austrian ambassadorial spouse. Uh, which a later writer called Barter Brides. So this is just a taste of best analysis of several paragraphs in that very book I just showed you. Um, the, the, the argument between the queen and a working class woman, you are, oh, you are a real mother and wife, oh, and the working class woman is moved to tears. We're very interested in that kind of topos, which does not just surface in the language itself. As wife of Keen in France, I'm a French woman. I am wrapping up. So, my last two slides. Marie Antoinette, 
is an exception in the way she can get in books of women who are considered good, and we are obviously problematizing this, but looking at the rhetoric of the books. Uh, but she can also get in books called things like Famous Affinities of History, i.e. love stories, and Enchanters of Men, or women of the, you know, si sirens of the world. Um, so time doesn't allow me to look at these final two slides in any real detail, but want, want to finish with the point that I got, I am very interested in who wrote these books, why between the two wars was this, there this anxiety to tell the stories of royalty in the Ancien Regime in France, as well as to approach uh, famous women of Vienna, which will be my last slide. So this is a woman who's extremely obscure, very difficult to find out about the authors of these books, and a series that was you know, quite remarkable. Um, and obviously, Marie, Princess of Poland, Queen of France and Navarre, just the, the geographical slidingness of these queens. Um, and this is my last slide, Famous Women of Vienna. And I had, in the abstract, I, it is incorrect, and I didn't find it out until after the publication of it. Alexander Mahan is just a doctor from California who spent five years in Vienna, and he writes this wonderful sort of history and, and quite favorable treatment of these Austrian famous, famous women, most of whom are the usual suspects that you hear about on the walking tours. Um, but I had falsely assumed he might have been a Jewish emigre because of the dates and his appearing in the United States. So, complicated geographies. I will uh, stop now so that we have time for discussion.